It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. Uh, um, this week we've got uh, Rusty joining us again for his third talk. Uh, I think uh, Rusty's joining that league of, uh, of people who've delivered the most talks for Bench Talk. It's brilliant to welcome Rusty back from uh, France. And uh, Rusty, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I can be defined uh, similar to Mississippi, the river. Um, a mile wide at the mouth and just a few inches deep. That's why I'm giving my third talk. Um, okay, so I'll talk about my trip to Amboise and I'll start sharing a screen. I don't actually have a presentation. I just have a whole bunch of pictures to go over. Um, bear with me. Oops, bear with me, hold on. Okay. This is called building suspense. Yes, speaking of building. Okay, so I'll start at the end. So this is the picture um, of the team on the last day, I believe, or day before last. And you can see the structure that we built and this uh, chapel in the background. Um, I'll start, uh, and I'll try to go a little bit in chronological order. So there's this organization called Carpenters Without Borders. Uh, it's predominant, it's based in France, but there are participants from other countries. And the way I found out about this organization is through Mortis and Tan magazine, because two years ago they came to the States and did a project in Maine where they built a blacksmithing shop for Mortis and Tan. And Mortis and Tan published a book about it and a documentary. And so that was the first time I heard about them. And then I looked them up and they basically do a project once a year, um, somewhere in the world, they, they try not always do it in France. Um, and they use hand tools only, so period appropriate technology. And once I saw it, I thought, wow, what a wonderful um, group of people, um, I'd like to join them. And so I emailed the organizer, Francois, we'll, we'll see him a little bit later. Uh, he's actually in a picture right here, if you can see the cursor. Um, and I said, uh, I'd love to join you guys next time, um, if possible. And he said, well, do you practice hewing? And I said, no, I've never done any hewing, um, but I learn fast and, and I'm not scared of uh, physical labor. And I assumed I will not hear back from them, seeing how I don't have any skills that needed for this. I did send them my chair making website and actually the link to the talk I gave here about chair making. And um, a few weeks later, I got an email from Francois saying, we would like for you to come and join us. Um, we will be building part of the roof structure for uh, Chapelle Saint Hubert. This is a 15th century chapel that was uh, built as a private chapel for the King of France, um, Francois I. And that is actually where Leonardo da Vinci is buried as well. And so how could I possibly say no? And they also wanted me to do um, a presentation about chair making. So this is the letter that I actually received when I got home, but it's basically the letter that invites me to um, come and participate in this, um, in this workshop. Um, and, and I've learned that this group is actually sponsored in part by uh, Ministry of Agriculture and they're talking about cultural exchange and so on. Um, this is probably the first time I was referred to as M Monsieur Rusty Um So I made arrangements to go and uh, get to Amboise and I, get, I got there on Sunday night, actually Sunday afternoon, um, and came to the work sites and uh, met the few people there that they uh, basically the logs were being arranged for the project was starting the next day. And so you can see a bunch of logs that are already um, cut to length being arranged. Um, those were cut, this is all French oak. It was cut about um, six or seven months ago and um, they were left in um, shade. So those are, this is the site before we started working. The logs are uh, in place. And then also there was, uh, the group came to, 
few weeks before that and built this cabin out of poplar. And there was a nice arrangement of tools there. You notice one of the people, uh, this is Lou, uh, she's holding this bearded ax with a very fancy handle. And you can see Pierre uh, holding a hewn ax, kind of lo looking at her, thinking, what is she gonna do with that? Um, this actually, her boyfriend ended up buying this, this X, um, and we'll see X is similar to this being used, but you can see that there's quite an arrangement of tools. Um, this is the view from the outside of the same group, and Lou, uh, sorry, Leo right here, who was um, the leader of my team and one of the top people uh, doing hewing, kind of looking at the tools, we all can probably recognize this look of can I, can I really get another X or another tool in my collection? I think that's what he's thinking. Um, I mentioned to Leo that, that uh, my great grandfather's name was Leo and he thought, he said, well, you know, there's another Leo here. And there was this Leo, that is the Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo actually spent the last few years of his life in Amboise, uh, invited by the French king and was buried there as well. Um, and you can imagine that's um, quite an honor to, to work on part of the roof for this chapel. Um, this is a uh, signs about describing that this was the burial place of Leonardo da Vinci. So on the first day before the work actually started, we got to go up and see what's happening, but just looking above the grade, you can see that the brickwork is starting to fail a little bit. Um, and the top of the, um, chapel has this beautiful spire. Um, there was one of the presentations that day was on Gothic uh, architecture and I've learned uh, what makes it Gothic and what actually it means. Why, why do we use this term Gothic? Um, and I might get to it a little bit later. Um, so we got to go up to the roof. Um, this is a, a British carpenter from London. I'm hoping to meet, meet up with him when I'm in London. Mihai, um, he participated in quite a number of um, those projects. The roof itself is covered in lead and it's about 19 ton of lead. So it's gonna be quite a, uh, a project to, to take it down and repair the whole thing. The project will go for about a year and a half. Ours was the first week of uh, renovation. Um, has beautiful carvings around it. Uh, this looks like a cat licking its paw. We got to go inside and get to see what's inside that roof. And you can't quite see the part of the structure that we replacing, but you can see that some of this um, structure is starting to fail and, and, and rot away. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, so another big impression from the first evening was those uh, big um, resawing saws that, that uh, I noticed. Uh, and we got to resaw some of those logs um, with them. And, and you'll see two different mechanisms. Um, some of us refer to, to this type of saw as a Rubo frame saw. And I built one of the very similar saws on a different um, size recently as well. Okay, so this is the, the morning of the first day. Uh, we're learning what teams we're in. Um, the gentleman holding well, in the in hat here, holding the uh, model of what we'll go into the building. This is Remy. He was the boss of the project. Um, he's one of the top carpenters, uh, specifically working with hand tools in, in France. And um, so he's explaining to us what we do. And a couple of things that were said uh, in this meeting were one, we're going to be really careful and try to not have any injuries. He recommended that we only work on 10 minute shifts and then take a break. And very quickly, I realized why 10 minutes is not too long when you swing in an X. Um, another thing he said was that we're not going to have any alcohol at lunch. I'm not sure if that's the first time they're doing it, but it was a really good idea. Um, I'll keep going. So this is again, he's taking us through the logs. Each log was assigned to a part of the structure that we go into the building. Uh, he's actually standing one of the bigger logs and that's the log that I got to do a little bit of work on. And so he kind of broke us into teams. We learned who's gonna be working on what part and then we actually started working. Um, so 
you should be able to hear it. Unfortunately, there's no sound, Rusty. There is no sound. All right, so hold on. Let me stop it and share it again with the song. How's it now? That's better. Okay. All right. So let's just go through it one more time. Okay. So this was kind of a brief view. This is two hours into the first day. This was kind of the view of the uh, working area and, and this, just the sound of, of people notching. Um, I, I should say that the process of hewing is done in three steps. So there's notching at first. You don't have to do notching. Sometimes we cut curves with a saw. It, it's a little bit faster, but you have to rotate log multiple times. Um, and then after notching, there's joggling. We'll see a little video of that where you've taken off uh, the big chips and it's done usually with a uh, different axe with a bearded axe. And then the final part is smoothing the surface with a hue and axe. Um, somehow I, I, I find it completely um, overwhelming to be watching those videos and kind of takes you back. Um, and of course there was the public. So you can see in the background, there's the Chapelle Saint Coupère and this is us working in a roped area. And then there's the public. We were joking that they are allowed to feed the animals um, in the zoo as they were looking at us. We were told that because there was a pretty strict COVID protocol, people had to be either vaccinated or tested every three days. We could work without masks on, but uh, if we interacted with the public, we had to put the masks back off. Um, so I'll move on to the next one. Yes, yeah, so to prove that I've done some work. And also, if you listen to the sound, you can hear the, the sound when I'm hitting at the right angle and the wrong angle. So one of the guys there, Paul, was telling me that you can tell by the sound if you're cutting the fibers with an X or if you just chopping through the fibers, which is not as efficient. He referred to it as, as the chunk and the dunk. So the chuck is, is the right sound. That, that's the sound the X makes when you're actually cutting with the fibers. Uh, and dunk is, is you're just chopping through them. That's not very useful. Um, another picture, uh, I, I like this one because you can see Pauline and Lou um, working on the logs and all the guys are kind of taking a, a rest looking around. Um, so this is a good shot you can see. So Pauline is using this bearded X. So this is X that's sharpened at a less of a, uh, let's see, more obtuse angle. So it splits the, the big chip off after you've done the, uh, the notches and it doesn't get stuck also in the fibers. Um, there's a video, uh, next one. I find it completely mesmerizing. Just just hearing the sound and and the the rhythm. Everybody's kind of working a little bit of a different rhythm, so they still notching. Um, I think this is yeah. This is the middle of video of juggling. So Leo in the background. Most of those guys are using those bearded axes. So uh, both Leo and Luik, this gentleman in the front is Luik, he's the son of Remy, who was the boss of the project. Um, they both do this kind of work for a living. So this is not their hobby once in a year, they come in and they spend a few days doing this. Uh, they're very, very proficient with an X. In fact, Leo talks, um, I'll say a few words about those guys. So Leo in the background, who was um, the, the leader of my team, he said that he was trained as an animating an animator um, artist uh, doing animation and, and very quickly realized that working in the cubicle was not for him. And so he 
moved into carpentry and discovered hand tool car carpentry and just mainly because he wanted to be outside. Luik here is, he's 22 years old and he's been doing queuing for 11 years. So it kind of tells you how proficient they are. Um, Leo is able to leave a surface off, uh, off of a bearded axe that looks like it's gone through a planer. It's absolutely amazing to, to watch them work and, and, and learn from the uh, process. So this is the process of hewing. This is the final process. Um, he's using a uh, hewing axe, a French axe. And if you look on the floor, you can, on the ground, you can see that it's almost paper thin, the, the shavings that it takes off. Um, I kept complaining that I, you know, every time I'd get on the log and try to do it, I would be ruining his work because the back corner of the X is just digging in. And, and he's, he kept saying, you know, it ain't easy. It's just not easy. There, there's no substitute for experience. Um, one thing to notice is that, as he pointed out, he's using a technique that's not the proper technique where the inside hand is in the front. And in the next video, you'll see uh, the the, uh, the cost of that. So this is him and Lou um, queuing, and right there he just banked his forearm into the log. Notice that she is actually using the proper technique where the inside hand is in the back, so it gives you a little bit of a space to get away from the log. This log was also very big; um, it was probably about two feet across, so it was. There was quite a bit of uh, work to do. So hewing, oh yeah, this is the surface that's that's being left after the X work. As you can see, it's just the quality of the work of those guys is, is, is pretty amazing. Um, hewing was going on for about two days. Um, that was mostly hewing. And then we got to the technical part of it. And so there were people in, in charge of the, um, both the technical drawings and the scribing of the joints. Um, and the French use a specific technique and some of you probably know about it much more than I do. This is actually the drawing for the whole process that has all the information in it. Uh, I believe the English term is stereotomy, although some say stereotomy is predominantly for stonework and not uh, woodworking and uh, roofing uh, geometry is maybe the better term for large detrait um, but this is part of the um, UNESCO heritage um, list. Um, and it basically is a way to make a two-dimensional drawing of three-dimensional objects. This is the type of um, technique that was used to sketch out the cathedrals. Um, I have very little understanding of how it works. Um, one of the guys there was a British guy who's going through a compagnon training, which is a uh, French uh, apprentice, apprenticeship uh, system. And he was trying to explain to me how all of the projections work. But in this drawing, there's all of the information, distances, heights, angles uh, for the whole structure. The next step was to lay out one-to-one -one this drawing on the ground. And so Eric here is setting up, there's quite a few pictures I have. So they're using those staples with lines in the ground so that once the pieces are hewn, you can actually lay them over this, uh, those strings and start scribing the joints. Um, in the background here is one of the log um, carts. This is what we use to move the logs around and then later also used for re uh, resawing. So again, this is another um, shot of of the, the system of um, strings that, that give you all the angles. And so uh, this is the timber that's ready to be scribed. We're gonna start laying out the structure. The maquette is telling you more or less what the structure is going to look like. And so um, you have, actually you don't quite see it here, but maybe an next, uh, sorry. This is the sill plate on the bottom, and then there's a cross beam and two tie beams. And so we're gonna start um, scribing those. And the piece that we were working on actually went up to the saw horses and started to get resawn. So those are the hips that will go into the, uh, into the um, 
structure. Um, it was not easy to get this piece up there. Um, and we tried different things. Uh, one is using this tripod with uh, block and tackle. And uh, then we realized that it's gonna get um, topped out before we can get it onto the saw horses. At the end, guys just ended up rolling this up. Um, at the end of each day, there was a presentation. So on the first day, there was a presentation with uh, the main architect of the project. And, and it got pretty tense. Notice everything is in French. So people were trans, I don't know any French. So people were translating uh, what was being said, more or less. Um, for those who were in charge of translation, it was extra work. But at the end of the first day, there was um, a heated discussion with the architect who seemed to be not particularly committed to the idea of using hand-hewn lumber. Um, at the end of the project, at the end of the week, we've learned that we did get a commitment from the main architect that what we're building will be used and hopefully will stay there for a few hundred years. Um, this is a picture of the presentation that the guys from the US, this is Hank Silver and Alicia Spence, they just did a project in DC where they built a trust for Notre Dame de Paris. Um, hopefully this trust will be shipped to France and will be used there as well. Carpenters Without Borders built a trust for Notre Dame a year ago in Paris. And again, they're now in, in negotiations of using, um, using this trust in the reconstruction. I'm learning that um, engineers and specifically insurance people uh, don't quite know how to um, how to estimate the stability and the strength of hand hewn lumber, specifically when it's green lumber. Another picture of resawing. Uh, okay, so this is the other setup that I found much easier to use, um, and this is using the uh, a different type of saw. Uh, uh, I think it's a Sheffield style um, pit saw was much easier. It was not as difficult to keep on the line. Um, okay, so I'll keep going on. Oh, so, yeah, so as part of my presentation, as part of my invitation, they asked me to do a presentation on chair making. So I actually gave a presentation that's similar to the one I gave here. And I also brought the stool uh, with me. It was in parts and they assembled it um, after lunch one day. People found it very, very interesting. Um, so this is the process of scribing. So again, the piece is being laid out over the strings. The strings kind of tell you all the angles. And then you scribe by just, so you make sure that all the pieces are exactly um, level. And so when you stand them up, they, they become plumb. And then you hang a plumb bob um, and, and transfer the lines. Um, And one of the, so this is Harry. Harry is a British guy who's doing apprenticeship in France. Um, at, at one point we got to use planes. So I finally, I was very comfortable. I was in my comfort zone and was able to help out more. Um, this is a picture of uh, Pierre doing um, hewing on one of the last logs. And every day there would be uh, hot air balloons coming uh, from behind the castle. Uh, this is the view from the castle onto over um, uh, the river uh, onto the, the other side of Amboise. Um, okay, so this is the, the one of the more difficult scribing pieces. So this is the king post. And as you remember in the uh, model, there's the hips are coming at each angle. And so the, the post has to be at a particular angle uh, you can see that there, there's two pieces that hold it. This is Jean Noël, who was in charge of the technical side of the project. Jean Noël was retiring. Um, he runs a, a school of woodworking in France, and he was retiring two weeks after this project. But notice the angle of this. And then this is one of the hips that this what came from the log that we were working on that after it's been resawn. And notice the angle that they have to be arranged at, and then you start scribing the mortise and tenons uh, joints. Um, this is another picture of the same uh, piece, noticing the complexity of those angles. Uh, mortises were cut with, in different ways. Uh, one is just to use to tea auger. The other one, uh, one of the people on the project, actually a British lady, um, Astrid Arnold, she brought a mortising machine that was actually made in Massachusetts, was, was fun to use. Um, 
here's Remy adjusting one of the uh, tenants to go through the uh, mortise. You know, when, when you start test fitting it, pieces are pretty heavy, right? It takes a few people. Um, this is where this piece goes. So there is the sill plate right here. This is the cross beam that's attached with um, half blind uh, dovetails. These uh, bent pieces also have dovetails at the bottom and then attached through mortise antenna. And then there's a, a locking key for both of those that's going to go in. Um, we had a visit from a gentleman who still makes shingles by hand. And he said that um, about one euro per shingle is, is the price. It was very interesting to, to listen to him talk. He talked about um, how it's important to put, follow the medullary rays when he splits the timber. Um, it was very, very interesting presentation. Okay, so this is the, the bottom of the structure is almost done. Uh, you can see that we have some of the mortises. I think this is the end of Thursday. Um, and we're starting to fit the, the vertical pieces into the um, structure. It's amazing to see guys uh, doing joinery with X's. So this is Luik adjusting one of the uh, pieces with, with an X. And this is his father adjusting a, a different piece also with an X. Uh, I put those two pictures together. Um, Notice those two, this is the father and son. Just, just think about working with your son and, and uh, uh, doing this kind of work together. What I also like is in the background, notice th there's a few minutes that pass through, right? Th there's a car in the bottom that's not there. Paul, uh, this guy with no shirt at the end, he hasn't moved much. Uh, he changed his expression. I talked to him later about it. He said he was thinking about what's for lunch. Uh, the food was also wonderful. Um, Okay, so we continue in doing this on Friday. Unfortunately, it started raining. Um, and most of the assembly was being done in the rain. Um, we talked a couple of uh, weeks ago, somebody showed one of those, um, I forgot what they were called, Baca mallets maybe. Uh, there were quite a few of those here, uh, different sizes. Um, it started raining harder on Friday, so we kind of had to quickly set stuff aside. You can see that this mortise where one of the rafters will go is almost filled with water. Uh, um, and this uh, picture, usually they do a carving signifying uh, the project. So this carving, this is um, Alexandra who's doing the carving. She actually apprenticed in Japan. Um, CSF 2021, I, I like to say that my biggest contribution to this project was to let Alexander borrow my raincoat. Um, at times I felt pretty useless because skills are very, very different from the skills that I have. Different uh, size of tools, different uh, positions of work and so on. So this is the final um, structure that's been assembled um, and that will be used. There's a couple of pieces missing just yet. Um, you can I try to line it up with where it's going to go. So this is the part of the roof that it will be supporting um, eventually. Uh, this is the view from the back. Um, and this is the technical drawing of what was being done. And you can see that our structure is going right here. And I think I have another picture of it. Yeah, so, so the, the chapel is, is, well, the coal castle is above the city. And so the chapel is uh, also elevated. Um, and I think this is the last picture that I have. So I think uh, I gave you kind of the idea of what it was like. I'll stop sharing and uh, open it up for questions. Thanks, Rusty, for um, a brilliant talk there. Uh, let's move on to the um, onto the questions as you just suggested. Um, anyone who hasn't been here before, if you put your name in the chat, it'll be your turn to ask a question. I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, I really was going fast through it. I, I can probably talk for another week about this. Um, I'll start by, by just talking about the emotional side of this. The camaraderie, I don't know if pandemic has much to do with this, but the camaraderie of being together and doing this work and you know, getting your hands destroyed. I had trouble closing my hand for the first, I don't know, five days just from just holding on to the X and swinging it and seeing the level of skill and, and um, art of the, the people who do this work. It was absolutely amazing. And then it was over. And it, it was raining the last couple of days. It was kind of 
made everyone a little bit sad, or at least me. And then I found it difficult reintegrating to my usual life. Um, so I'm hoping that the trip to London in a few weeks is, is gonna uh, make things much better again. Thanks, Rusty. Uh, I think Jeffrey's up first this time. Welcome uh, back, Jeffrey. Uh, unmute myself. I, I can't believe that I got in first, the first question. Um, Rusty, that was, that was amazing. And, I, and I'm so um, jealous of your experience because, I mean, that that just looks amazing. And all those, um, you know, the, the new skills that you say that you're learning. But my, my, my question really, I think you, you almost answered it as soon as I put my name in the thing, was about the physical content of it. Because when you're working with these massive, massive beams um, and, you know, being green timber, um, it, it's... Uh, you know, it's really heavy and you see the size of the tools. I mean, what, what was the physical sort of, you know, feeling like at the end of each day and, you know, how did you get on and how did they move things around to make it easier for you? Um, so I did a tiny bit of practice. Um, Hank Silver, I spoke with him before I flew over and he said it, it might be a good idea to practice. So I, I did a little practice and, and I had probably five blisters in the first two hours and learned that I, I need to find a good pair of gloves. This was back in the States. Um, another thing that happened is um, I think the day before the project started, so on Sunday when we were setting out logs, I forgot to drink water. And so the first day I was getting lightheaded right away. And you know, you're standing on the log and you're swinging an X between your legs and, and being lightheaded was, was not, not particularly comfortable. Um, so I really try to take my time and not not create an injury um i don't remember being tired much mostly because um there was quite a bit of wine uh and beer consumed in the evenings so i i slept really well but yeah you're sore and uncomfortable uh some of the guys uh now doing a different project already and they living in tents in the in the forest uh one of the guys there does this kind of work 10 months in a year human specifically so, yeah, it's it's demanding, yeah. But I think the happiness of being part of that team um, completely um, cancels out the discomfort. Um, yeah, getting a shower in the evening was pretty nice. They put me up in a hotel; it was great. Yeah. So, so maybe we need to do a, a, a green oak uh, a workshop and and get like uh, several of you to come and uh, come and build it for me. That sounds sounds like a good idea to me. I, I think that would be great. There's quite a few members of the group who are from England. Um, and I think uh, there's, there's quite a bit of this type of work being done in, in England as well. Yeah. So I, I, I think next project they're going to try to organize outside of France because they try to do France, non-France, alternate those. Uh, yeah. So if, if, there's a, if there's an interesting project, they would love to do it. I think they're particularly interested in doing historical projects and also charity projects. So if yeah. there's a bridge that needs rebuilding in England, uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with Francois. Sounds good. Sounds good. And I, and I look forward to uh, you coming to London for that same uh, camaraderie that uh, that you experienced. Absolutely. Hopefully we can yeah. generate the same stuff with with, uh, with us in London. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Good. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh... So now we've got Matthias. I uh, just need to find him and I can. Um... Yes, I'll start talking. Maybe that will oh, help. There we you. go. That, that helps. That's wonderful. There you go. There you go, Matthias. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Rusty. That was, I mean, like, like Jeffrey said, that was awesome. Uh, uh, and I mean, your presentation was fantastic, but I can, I can only start to imagine what a great week that must have been. Uh, so yeah, a fair bit of, of, of uh, gr the green-eyed monster of jealousy from me as well. Uh, as for questions, I one thing you were saying kind of struck me uh, uh, that the architect was hesitant about using hand-hewn lumber. I mean, how on earth could you even imagine using anything else on a restoration of a 15th century structure that would have been built that way? Uh, what was the reasoning behind of that? Well, could, could you expand a bit more on that? Um, I, I really cannot because um, some of the stuff was had to be translated to me later on. It was ah, late yeah. in the day. Um, 
I, I will probably misrepresent, but my understanding is that um, engineers and insurance are the two main, um, uh, main problems. Hmm. Um, and because everything has to be insured. So my understanding, so for example, moving the trust from Washington DC that the Americans built hmm. for Notre Dame, moving it to France is a huge undertaking. They don't know how to ship green lumber. They don't know how to insure it. They don't know what company needs to move it. And then at the same time, you need to be, you know, all of this, there's so much red tape involved. Yeah. And so the engineers know how to work with other engineered lumber or dried lumber. Um, you know, they have all the strengths measurements for it. Uh, the fact that all of those buildings have been built with in this way, mm -hmm. uh, 400, 600 years ago, does not seem to register. So there's quite a bit of education that happens both from people who are part of this organization and historians. Yeah. Uh, so one of the presentations there was by a gentleman who's um, considered to be the authority on uh, Gothic uh, architecture. Yep. And, um, and I knew very little about Gothic architecture. I had no idea where the term Gothic came from. I actually learned later on after the presentation, I did some research. This is not the answer to your question, but I think it's interesting. It's actually a derogatory term um, yes. developed by, by the Italians. Mm -hmm, so absolutely. this was the Italians way of saying, so before Gothic architecture, the only architecture was classical, Italian, Roman. Yeah. And so they, they uh, instead of using the word barbarians to describe the architecture of Northern uh, Normandy, Oh, the, uh, the, the Europe. There. That's right. Yes, they, because Goths were responsible for uh, the fail, the fall of the Roman Empire. Yep. They basically were saying this is how the barbarians do it: those pointy exactly. uh, steeples. Um, yeah. So, so there's quite a bit of education that that's being done right now, mm -hmm. and um, specifically for historical buildings. And and it it's not going easy, but they they able to. Um, to get people uh, to agree with historically appropriate uh, ways of uh, renovating those things. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Again, I, I don't think I'm doing it justice. I think Francois would be able to uh, to say, to explain it much better. And maybe yeah. I'll ask him to, to do a little uh, write up on that. Yeah, right here. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthias. Over to Chester. Uh, Rusty, that was a great presentation. I um, uh, I really don't have any questions for you because um, there's there's so much there that uh, I I could spend a year asking you about. Um, so there's nothing specific, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, how you came to uh, to discover that this work was being done and that they were taking people with UNESCO. And, um, and how you got into it. Uh, besides that, I wanna say that it was very nice to actually see the video of you chopping because I've been keeping up with your posts and uh, it seemed to me that you were just there as a photographer. So it was nice to see you actually swinging an ax and it was nice to see you came home with both legs. So congratulations yeah. on your work and if you could talk about that part of it, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. So I I'll start with the second part first. So. Um, you know, when, when people are working, and this is my first time with the group, there were people there that have been doing it for 15 years with this group, yeah? I, I felt very much like an outsider. And so it, it was very uncomfortable for me to ask someone to take a picture of me working. Uh, I finally did it, I think, on the second day, which is how the only pictures that I'm in, I asked Pauline when she was taking a break if she could take some pictures, just as a, as a proof that I've done a little bit of work. Um, it got a little bit more um, feeling like an outsider and not really contributing once I chopped the mortise in the wrong place. And, and th there were so many, uh, again, because this was very much of a fun project uh, and not uh, you know, the, the precise work kind of project. Um, usually the person who marks the joint cuts the joint because we had a time limit, we had to finish it, and, and there's fun being had by everyone. It, there were some people, everybody was doing something, yeah? And so I was shown to, to cut a mortise, there were four lines, I was absolutely certain, I, I recognized the two lines that where I needed to cut it, and it turns out it was in the wrong place. 
we ended up fixing it and, and the, the joint didn't move at the end. Um, but um, it, it was, yeah, I, I, I definitely need to have a few more years if they invite me back, I hope, um, before I start feeling comfortable there. In terms of how I learned, um, I saw the Mortis and Tenon uh, book about it and I Googled it and, and I just asked to be part of it. And, and this probably brings me, uh, it's a good segue to talk about my best skill in life in general, and that's being lucky. Uh, this is exactly how I got into this group. And I'm extremely grateful to Jimmy for mentioning this group and, and forwarding my information to Jeffrey and meeting up with you guys for what is a year and a half now. It's completely undeserved, uh, but I do appreciate it and I do enjoy it. So that was the same thing. I emailed uh, the organizer, Francois. He asked me if I had any skills. I told him I, I do have some skills in chair making, but I've never used an ax, but I can learn. And somehow he believed that I can and, and let me come in. I think mostly for the entertainment for the group to learn about chair making. It sounds like there's not a lot of people making chairs in France and there was some interest. When I did my presentation, there were many questions and hopefully I'll, I'll be able to go back there and maybe teach a class in chair making. Um, yeah, that's it. Very nice. So did you have to qualify besides that initial letter or um, was there uh, or just, did you have to pay your own way over in your hotel or? Uh, how did that they work? covered my hotel and my meals. I paid for my tickets there. Well, I think it's a it's a great project that you worked on, and I think it's great that you did that. And uh, Thank look you. forward to hearing more about it. That's great. I'm really hoping to. I'm hoping that the Francois, the organizers, will watch this video, and I'm really hoping to be invited back, whether I have to pay for my hotel and meals or not. Well, I'm sure they're going to need a photographer. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Rusty. Thank, Thank you. you, Chester. Um, over to you, Phil. Hi, Matt. Hi, Rusty. Thanks for that. I enjoyed that, and I could tell that it meant a lot to you, and you enjoyed it as well. I've got a. I don't know. Maybe maybe this isn't the question that I should be asking you, but it's an axe question. It's a technical question. Um, you talked about the hewing axes, the broad axes before that, and you talked about knuckles and forearms and hitting a hand. Were any of those axes offset? Asymmetric, because just looking, they looked pretty much standard, like they were running on the bevel, not on an edge. Um, so, so there's three types of axes used. But there's a failing axe used for for uh, making notches. Yeah. Those are symmetric. Yeah. Um, or double bevel. Um, there's the bearded axe that's used for joggling, so taking big chips off, mm -hmm. and this is also double bevel. Most of the hue and axes were single bevel and have an offset handle. Okay. There were some hue and axes that were double beveled as well. Um, when, you, when you say single bevel, are you talking about single bevel like that or single bevel chisel profile? Right, chisel profile. Yes, okay. single okay. bevel oh. being one side is, is exactly um, in line yeah. plumb with a log. And so for, for this kind of axe, you have to have your handle uh, yeah. to the side otherwise you're going to be hitting your knuckles all the time uh, with a yeah, double yeah. bevel x you don't have to so so the the hue and x that i got for myself it's actually very versatile you can use it for um all the parts except for jog well juggling would be a little bit more difficult um but it's it's similar to the basque x basque x have a much bigger eye and so you hang the handle from the bottom of the handle you don't need a wedge and so it's really easy to switch um, handles on this type of X. Like a tomahawk. Does that make any sense? A tomahawk? Say again? You, you handle it through, you handle it from the top through the eye and it, it sits. That's right. Like a pickaxe. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm not familiar with pickaxes, but sure, right. yeah. Right. So you can easily take right. the handle but, off and you can put a different handle on. Okay, right? all right. But but fine. This... Yeah. Chisel profile, some offsets and hopefully to not too many knuckles were damaged. Right, right. So, so the French axes, my understanding that all the French axes are single bevel. Uh, some of the Scandinavian Q and axes specifically are yeah, uh, yeah. double bevel, so you can use from both sides. The double bevel axes were particularly useful on the curved pieces. When you when you hew in on the inside, it, it's it's useful to be able to do it from different angles. Um, 
as a very beginner, for me, it's easier to be able to switch hands and, and be able to go from different uh, different sides. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Good. That makes sense. Thank you. I was. Somebody mentioned there is a saying that if you watching a guy hewing in the heat of the summer, you cannot tell them they're doing it wrong. And so everybody was doing it in the way that he's got the axe. Possible. He's got the axe. Don't, don't be rude. But that's well. There's that too. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. And thanks again Here's for the talk. Over to Nick. Uh, hi, Rusty. Thanks very much for the talk. My pleasure. Um, it, it's brilliant. It, it reminds me, I did a timber framing course in Scotland about 15 years ago. And the, the strongest memory I got from that is we were, we were working green oak and it smelled absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Were, were you using oak and did it smell that good? It, well, I don't know how your oak smelled. Uh, oak has uh, quite a um, spectrum of smells. Um, this smelled wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, some of the American red oak can smell horrible. Uh, white oak smells to me like pickles. Uh, it was yeah. French oak. It's probably closest to the white oak in the US that I'm comfortable with. Uh, it smelled great. Yeah. So that but, that, that first log that you had a picture of that you said you worked on, that was white oak, wasn't it French oak? Yeah, all, all, of, the, all of the logs were um, French oak, they refer to it. So it, yeah. in, in France, they don't talk about white or red oak. They, they yeah. just call it French oak. My understanding that it would fall into the white oak uh, group because the, I asked them, uh, the leaves are rounded and yeah. that's a characteristic of white oak. Yeah. And did you, did you get that sort of classic thing where you've... Um, You've used a chisel and an axe, and the, the tannins are on the blade of the tool, and then you come to it the next day, and it's gone that amazing sort of bluey color. Absolutely. Yeah. How can you not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, the, uh, I think Friday night was the, the night with the party, and there was a pizza, and, and the guys were cutting it with, a, with an axe. And it was really interesting for me to watch that they really made sure to clean the axes after cutting the pizza. Yeah. yeah. And they were more concerned about the, the grease on the axe than the tenons. Yeah. And, and, and if you leave it long enough, it, it pits the steel really, really quickly. It's incredible. Right. Yeah. 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 So the same thing in chair making, you know, we use, uh, we use quite a bit of uh, green oak. Yeah. And I'm very familiar with the, the, if I'm not careful, the knife will be, as you said, bluish black the next day, the next day, the, the draw yeah. knife. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm just going to find Jim. Where are you, Jim? Hello there. I'm here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Jim. Can you hear me, Rusty? I can hear you. I can't see you, but uh, it, it took three talks for you to ask me a question. I well, you know, I, I actually, do you know what? I, there's a couple of questions. First of all, actually not a question. Um, I'm thrilled that somebody I know actually got involved with the uh, Charpentier Sans Frontier because after the um, uh, the best, I think the best uh, article that was in, I think it was early 2020 of the raising of the, the barn for the blacksmith shop in Maine when they came over to your home country. And um, that was a fantastic uh, article in Mortis and Ten. And I think we talked about it at some point. Um, and uh, I guess I guess they then fell in love with the whole idea of the French connection, and uh, and then stayed in touch, and that's how you got your connection through to them. Is that is that how they they're keeping in touch with them? Are they? Um, so the there were my understanding how ca that came about is that there are three or four members that have been part um, of uh, Carpenters Without Borders for a few years now. Americans. It's Joshua, Joshua Klein, isn't it? Joshua Klein is not part of this uh, group, but he's the editor of uh, Carpenter uh, of uh, Mortis and Town. Yeah, he was it the was one that actually, did the article. Um, yeah. It was actually Will Gusakov, who is part of Carpenters Without Borders and a professional timber framer, um, who um, developed the plans for the um, blacksmithing shop for um, Mortis and Town. Right. and was in charge of that project. Uh, so that, that was the connection. So the Carpenters Without Borders were talking about that they would like to come to the States and do a project. 
And so they were on the, on the lookout for a good um, projects to do. And uh, between Will Gusakov and Will, Will Lisak, uh, that's how it came about. I, I re really recommend both the book and the documentary that um, Mortis and Tan guys uh, did about the project. It was wonderful. In fact, meeting the guys that I saw in the documentary, it was like meeting um, Hollywood stars because the first time I saw them was on TV. And so uh, my wife was actually telling me, you should bring the book and ask them to autograph the book. Um, yeah, so that, that's how I learned about it. And, and, and the second question was about, you, you mentioned side axes, and this is a little bit, uh, this is a little bit interesting because um, presumably everybody that being of that skill level were all left-handed then in that case, because, um, you know, they're handed, aren't they, side axes? I don't know how to respond to that. Um, uh, with a side axe, you have a left-handed or a side axe. The vertical side of the axe is either if you're cutting with your left hand, it's got to be on the right hand side. And if you're cutting with your right hand, it's got to be on the left hand side. So, A, I don't know what you're saying makes sense. Uh, people can adjust to the axes they have. And also, there are left handed axes and right handed axes. So, I don't know how many of the people were left handed and, and how many of the um, axes had, had the. I mean, most of those axes. Rust, Rusty, are, I think it. You are made now. I think I'm, it was uh, a joke, Rusty, because Jim's left-handed. I'm, I'm implying oh, that I'm you know the skill levels of the people there must all be left-handed, surely, because then they didn't have to worry about. Okay, the I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize we, we, we're back to talking about how great you are. Do you do you know do you know my side axe? Right, uh, I I bought it ages and ages ago, and um, I didn't realize they were handed, and and I've been using this side axe for ages and ages. And somebody said to me, where did you find that left-handed side axe? And I said, are they all like that? And uh, no, they're not. They're predominantly right-handed, of course. But, so um, so just, just to make this a little bit more complex, you can actually take uh, an axe with a flat on the left side of the blade. And flip it around. And yeah, and you're going to have to put a different handle on it and actually use the bevel as the flat. I don't think it will be um, as efficient as using the flat side. Oh it's no, it's got to be straight down. It's the, the, the flat side, the, the vertical side has got right. to be against the wood. So you, when you're slicing down, you're, you're doing that shaving um, yeah. effectively down in a vertical fashion. If you have the bevel on that side, every time you do it, it'll kick out. Uh, I, I disagree. I, I think the guys um, that I saw there, the level of skill they have, they actually, they're not chopping. When they're hewing, they're not chopping they slicing that yeah shaving piece. yeah and their their skill is such that they can do it with the with the other side probably just as well maybe not as quickly probably. Probably. but yeah i mean i don't know if you can tell but i'm completely in awe of oh absolutely of, of skill and mastery me too i watched that barn barn erection thing and uh it's, it was just amazing so yeah yeah i agree well thank you so much rusty I'm, i've been looking forward to this for ages for a week actually when i Heard thanks, come on, so. thanks, mate. Take care. Thank you very much, Jim. Over to you, Eric. Can't call me nothing there. Uh, no, hi, hi, Rusty. No, that, that was really interesting. Really, yeah, I am. You know, I'm very, very jealous at doing that. I'm always in awe of some doing things with big, big bits of wood. I've been wrestling with some modest size bits myself and <laughs> respect. But a well, number, number of questions. One is uh, that wood, I, I've been working with oak and, and it seems to have a life of its own. It does move around a lot once you've, once you've cut it. Uh, was there much movement between cutting the joints and finally fixing them? So did it need a lot of sort of fine, fine trimming to get the joints to actually fit on the day? The, yeah, so it's hard for me to tell how much of it was from the wood movement. Uh, the whole project was one week, right? So th there wasn't that yeah, much. It was of quite it. quick. But uh, all, all of the joints definitely had to be fitted uh, separately. And and you noticed one of the guys using an axe to, to fit the joints as well. Yeah. yeah um, some of it was done with slicks. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it boggles my mind. Uh, from talking with Leo, he was telling me that. Um, there was actually in one of the pictures that was a little drawn that you probably wouldn't be able to see, but he was saying that it is much better if, if you're not able to make the sides exactly vertical, 
it's better to make them a little bit uh, concave so the inside right. is closer in because as the oak dries it can you know it can push those middles out a little bit uh -huh. so there is some of that it, it's much easier to scribe with the plumb line if uh, the outsides are a little bit wider than the inside of the log um, right. so again they the masters understand wood movement and and how oh, quickly uh... it dries these logs were not the freshest yeah, and, and there was a, a few mentions that it's easier when, when the log just been cut and you work in it. Uh -huh. um, but then also it moves a little bit more. Uh, uh, yeah. So once, they, you know, once they, they've uh, assembled it, uh, everything obviously fit, fits together, but it's still on the ground. It's got to go up to the up to the roof to get to fit it in. Do the dismantle it and take it up in bits and then reassemble it in situ or do they somehow lift the whole thing up and if so how do they how do they do that are they still using medieval sort of methods to get it up to the roof um i don't know the answer to that I, i'm gonna take a guess so the structure is gonna sit there for about a year right. before they put uh, it up there uh i mean it's a huge project yeah just taking the roof uh, down and taking the spire down it's going to take a while. My guess is that they're going to move it up with a crane. And yeah. uh, I don't know that they will reassemble it. Um, they might. I mean, everything is pegged. Yeah, there's there's a peg going through pretty much every piece. Mm -hmm. And and those all were draw board uh, pegs. Um, they would have to drill them out. Uh, to yeah, it so I, I'm guessing it's going to move as one unit. Yeah, that suggests that. Yeah. A heavy unit. But, but uh, yeah. <laughs> wouldn't like to be in the end of the rope pulling that one up <laughs> yeah so my, I, I'm, I'm guessing they'll be using cranes right, um, yeah normally you would assemble it in place right and just right. keep it there it's, okay you know that, that's that's me Th thanks very much rusty it's great Absolutely. Right. <laughs> thank you very much eric over to sean is he napping too no it's just a little just my, my normal snooze um that, that was fantastic. I mean, je jealous isn't the word at all. Um, but after a, a week of watching those guys work with these impressive and lethal looking axes, is there anything, any tricks you've picked up that you're going to transfer to your own work as a chairmaker? Do you think you're going to be using axes more in any part of that work? Or do you think there isn't a huge amount of crossover there? And, and that's that. I don't know. If um, necessarily it's going to move in the chair making. One of the tricks that I really learned was from the gentleman who's doing the shingles mm -hmm. when he talked about splitting on the medullary array. I, I've never thought about this uh, until I heard him say that and it makes perfect sense. He, he, he made a point. And again, everything was in French and was translated for me, which I'm so grateful for. But medullary array is the weak point between fibers and those splitting right on the medullary array and he was talking about how he can tell by looking at the measure array whether the log will split well or not. If there's any kind of deviation in the measure array, it suggests there's going to be um, not a good log for him to, to buy. Um, I, I don't know. My, my feeling right now, you know, I'm following some of the guys who were there and working on a different project now um, in Brittany. And, and I'm thinking, if I have a chance to go and work for free, uh, I'll, I'll take it any time. I'm not sure that they would want me <laughs> there, uh, having seen my um, productivity. But but I will get better. Um, so, it, you know, it's hard to connect from one to another. But um, from from um, um, doing timber framing to uh, chair making, I do have a hope. At one, that one day I will have a timber frame workshop for chair making. That would be amazing. Um, and so that was kind of going along those lines. Uh, my chair making teacher did a timber frame. He actually bought a sawmill and felled the trees and, and saw all, all his timber frame. And one of his students just did the same thing in Texas with the same uh, sawmill, actually. He bought it from, from the guy. Um, I don't know that. I would try to hew my timber frame, but but hopefully at one day. Um, meanwhile, I, I am I just registered for a two-day stereotomy class um, taught by the only American uh, compagnon who did the whole oh, wow. I think ten years in France, and he's one of the um, 
top carpenters, historical carpenters in Canada. He teaches out of um, Ottawa. Um, so I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about this and then learn more about timber framing and, and eventually build a shop. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. Uh, yet again, thank you so much for sharing. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Matthias has got another question for you. Yes. Uh, uh, what uh, Jim was mentioning made me think of another question that I forgot to ask. Uh, so when they were doing the hewing and basically all the other operations to, to square the log, uh, were they paying attention to or, or taking into consideration fibre directions? So pre predominantly working from one direction towards another or, or was it more how, how the log happened to fall as it were? So both yes and no. So fiber direction is important um, when uh, specifically when you're joggling. Mm -hmm. A little bit less uh, with with hewing, but very important with joggling. In fact, Leo said that when you're starting on a new, so the the big chip between two notches. Yeah. You kind of try to find the weak point and then work that weak point until you take the big chip off. And then you, I mean, it's amazing. Leo was saying that he, he practices to split the line with that bearded X. Yeah. I'm, I'm guessing bearded X weighs about maybe four kilos. Yeah. Um, and what he's able to do with it, and you know, you time after time, you hit it in the same spot and you follow this fiber, unless you see the fiber that's running in. And so you, you move a little bit further in and you make a stop cut and then you follow this fiber in um so yeah no the, the the fiber direction is important on small operations yeah definitely you don't care about the fiber when you do notches because uh, no. you go almost across the grain exactly um not so much with um with human just because you're shaving the fibers yes um, yeah, yeah but basically you're, you're 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 pretty much traversing the wood actually yeah yeah and sometimes you'll notice at the very bottom, uh, they usually would use a different kind of two-handed slicing of the fibers uh, with a lot of control so that it doesn't break out because there's no support for the fibers at the bottom of the log. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Matthias. Um, Rusty, I've got one final question for you. Uh, that is, are you now inspired to build your own roof? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I, I, I know that I'm so far away from having an understanding of, of how to do it. I, I'm guessing that was a joke just by looking at your facial expression. Of course but, it was. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not. I'm definitely inspired to build my own shop. It's not going to have a very complex Gothic roof on it. He's going to get you I've, to build your own chapel soon if you're not careful. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Temple. A temple of, of chair making. Um, I'm definitely inspired to go back and contribute if, if I'm allowed, um, as long as I'm able to contribute. Uh, and, you know, I'll practice much more for the next trip and, and make sure that I'm, I'm more useful. <laughs> well, Rusty, thank you very much for a great talk tonight. And um, I think it's been a pleasure to have you come and talk again. And I'm sure there'll be another thing that you can come and talk about in the future as well. So um, cheers to Rusty and cheers to the bench. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Rusty, Rusty and the bench. bench. Cheers. Cheers, cheers, Rusty. Cheers. Cheers, mate.